introductions. My name is Miranda Phelps McGuire. I work at Public Health Madison Dane County. Um, I've been there a little over two years. I started in the COVID world um, and moved into prevention and I really love it. Um, I also staff the Dane County Alliance Against Commercial Tobacco. And that is a state funded alliance. Um, it's funded by DHS and more specifically the Tobacco Prevention Control Program. And we're kind of a scattered group throughout the state. We do similar work in like our local communities. Uh, we're going to be talking about commercial tobacco today, commercial tobacco products. Um, these are products that are made for profit by big companies. And we uh, just always want to say that when we talk about these products, we aren't talking about the sacred tobacco that's used by indigenous and Native American people for cultural and religious ceremonies. So I always just want to say that to get going. So today we're going to be talking about trends and new products. So things that are currently on the market. We'll talk about health effects, education and policy, and how to talk to your kids. We don't have any kids here today, but hopefully we'll have some watching and, and we'll, we'll talk about um, best practice for that. So. Um, trends and new products, how vapes evolved, and what to look for um, when it comes to our kids. So we know nationally that about one in four Wisconsin high schoolers has tried e-cigarettes. Um, this is according to the 2022 Wisconsin Youth Tobacco Survey. Um, overall, vaping is slightly down, which is a good indicator, but still way too high, and any kids vaping are, is too many kids vaping. 66% um, of high school students say that it's easy to get a tobacco product. So we know that we hear from, hi, welcome. We're just getting started. So 66% um, of kids say that it's easy to get a tobacco product. Um, we hear that they're getting them from stores, from friends, from older um, siblings, sometimes from parents, and online. Uh, we see new shops pick, popping up all the time. I think Teresa and I were just saying that Stoughton has five dedicated smoke shops, and that doesn't count any of the big box retailers or uh, gas stations where you can find these products. We do do tobacco compliance checks. So my team and I take out 16 and 17 year olds throughout communities like Stoughton. Um, we were here a couple weeks ago. We checked nine businesses, didn't have any sales. But when we were here last November, we had two sales. So it kind of depends, uh, but it happens, and it's something that we like to keep an eye on. Of the Wisconsin teens that have tried any tobacco product, 53% try vapes first. So we know that vapes are by far the most popular tobacco product amongst teens. And flavors are a big part of what attract young people to flavors. 92% of kids say that they would never try a tobacco product that wasn't flavored. So it's really become the norm. These are some local data slides, and Teresa was so helpful to get these right so quickly. Um, it's by far the, the quickest I've gotten 2023 20, numbers. So these are from your specific high school students. So vaping is at about a 9% rate. We're seeing slightly more females than males vaping, um, and we see that progression throughout 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, um, where kids kind of start more. This, I'm sorry, I'm gonna back up. This slide is specific to the teens that have vaped in the last 30 days. So I always like to, to note that. So in the last month of being surveyed, this slide shows high school students who have ever tried vaping. So you see the rates are a lot higher, 25% um, generally, and by 12th grade, that number goes up to 32%. This slide shows Stoughton High School students who've used any other tobacco product. It's about a 5% rate. Um, when I talk to kids, 
you know, some kids still do smoke regular conventional cigarettes. I hear Parliament is a popular brand. Um, but a lot of kids are into these little flavored cigars. And these are interesting because um, kids can use them, hollow them out, put other smokable substances in them as well. And also the price point. These go for about a dollar to two dollars. So if they know somewhere where they can get a tobacco product, this is the most easy entry um, tobacco product for the student. That's a two pack. Right? This is a two pack, yep. Um, something we also hear about is are these chews? These are relatively new to the market. And these really exploded after the vaping epidemic um, that we'll talk a little bit later because kids are becoming severely addicted to nicotine and they need something to kind of get them through when they're not able to vape. So they can stick one of these kind of in their mouth. It's kind of like the next gen chew and it, it helps with cravings. And I've seen them just started in parking lots all over town, including um, high school. So. They become more and more popular. I heard that on social media. There's something called Zinfluencers, which is you know, you know famous Insta Instagram people that kind of, you know, make it more popular. I can't get my head around that one. This slide shows Stoughton High School students who have tried quitting tobacco products in the last 12 months. So as we know, most people who use tobacco products would like to quit and have tried to quit, and this is no different for kids. Um, you see that by 12th grade, most uh, tobacco users who are, are using have tried to quit. This is a slide from the previous um, risk behavior survey. So in this slide, you see in 2022 and 2021, rates were slightly higher. This slide shows from 2018 to 2022, the marked decrease in teen vaping which again is a really good sign. And this slide shows the 2013 to 2022 cigarette use. So while it's a great job that we're doing, or we're doing such a great job keeping kids from smoking cigarettes from 13% all the way down to one to 3%, we've kind of erased that gain with vaping because now we're seeing vaping rates kind of where cigarettes were 10 years ago. That's a lot of numbers. I always like to, you know, fr frame this as well as I can. You know, most teens do not use substances. You know, our kids make great choices every day. Um, it's really good to know that there's a strong disconnect between the amount of kids that actually vape and what the kids think that their peers are doing. So we have about 10% of kids that are actually vaping. But if you ask kids, you get like a 70% number. So kids are the, under the impression that many more kids are vaping or using substances than actually are. And that kind of gets into the perception versus reality. Is there any account in any of the statistics for like whether the teens answering the numbers on the survey are being I don't know a lot about that sort of data abstraction. I know that when they're given the survey, they're told that it's anonymous. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's anonymous, and then, so these are extrapolated. UPI does one of the, the surveys, the Youth First Behavior Survey, and um, Dane County Human Services does the other one, which is the Dane County Youth Survey. So we're able to get data almost every year from one or the other, which is how you get to see that. They didn't used to ask the questions so we weren't able to manage that as well. But yes, they are weighted for a ratio that they'll know to throw out. You know, somebody goes through and answers yes to That's, you know, automatically. So when they give us our total numbers, it's the usable data that they come by. And yeah, we know there's still probably a five or so percent variance in reality. And at times you'll see data, I don't think, I don't know if they're on, this or what I said from last year, but um, we had uh, no actual valid data on vaping in ninth grade last year. <laughs> Don't know why, um, but you know that was something that happened in a while. So, um, 
So, yeah. Oh. It's a good question, though. Yeah, I know that I would be leery as a team probably taking a survey wondering like who is going to see it and if my teachers or parents were going to see it. So that's a really good point. Just thinking about like you said, you know, the impression that kids have is that it's about 70% that what we're seeing is like a lot of 10. Yeah. Just yeah. Not, not that their perception is completely reality, but just wondering if there's any. Yeah, I mean, I hear what you're saying and I mean, if I had to guess, I would say rates are probably a little higher than, than they're being shyer. Higher. <laughs> yeah. 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 So one of the things we're going to be working on though is positive norming, um, yeah. which is saying that 89% aren't. Mm -hmm. And let's get that word out among yeah. the students. So if I go to have a student group at high school that are looking at how do we frame that so people know yeah, no, that's that good. not everybody is doing that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, no, this is good. Um, so another kind of perception versus reality thing is kids are seeing images and ads and shows about, you know, that future vaping and cigarette and other tobacco use all the time. So a recent study from the Truth Initiative showed that 60% of the kid, or the shows that are most popular among 15 to 25 year old kids show tobacco use in the show, so it just really normalizes it. There's also a ton of vaping like hacks and stuff on TikTok and Snapchat and all these little sub-genre feeds you can get into. So I think kids probably see it more than we do. Okay. All right, the evolution of an e-cigarette. So, E-cigarettes were invented in China in the early aughts. At first they looked really similar to a regular conventional cigarette. They weren't very popular. They weren't really user friendly. They were delivered a really harsh hit. Um, then the market moved to vape pens and box mods. Some of these are still available today in different variations. They're more for like the adult user. You get a juice, you fill up your device, you know, it's a little bit more. Uh, hands-on. Um, Juul kind of changed everything. So around 2015, Juul came onto the market, and what they did is they realized if they took the nicotine and added a salt to it, benzoic acid, they are able to produce something called nicotine salt, which means that they were able to jack up the levels of nicotine um, in the device while providing a way smoother and more satisfying hit. Um, so they were able to get the levels up to like what you would get from a cigarette, um, but it was a much more enjoyable and pleasurable way to do it. Then they started adding flavors, and this kind of changed everything. Um, Jewel was all over Instagram. They were sponsoring tents at Sundance Film Festival and others. They were just kind of everywhere. And the FDA finally just you know, said, hey, you guys are obviously selling to kids and you can't do that anymore. So you need to take all your flavors off the market. So this is like 2018, 2019. So then some really smart young people said, well, what if we take the nicotine and synthesize it? So it's no longer naturally derived. Now it's a synthesized product. And we'll still have it at five milliliters and it will turn it into this disposable device, so you can buy one for five to ten dollars, and we'll call it a puff bar. So this is kind of the next generation of what happened. This is around 2000, and I better check. Yeah, 2019. So the FDA said, oh, okay, well actually we're going to regulate that too. You can't do that. So other products just kept flooding the market and filling the holes. Um, Elf bars were kind of the next big one. So this device, five milliliters of nicotine, is equivalent to about a pack of cigarettes. So for five to ten dollars, a kid could get their hands on one of these and have a pack's worth of cigarettes readily available. Also, you know, if my daughter smoked one of these, four hours before I saw her, I'd probably know. But this is something that you can consume in a bathroom or a bedroom and quickly um, disperse the smell. There really is not a lot of smell and really hide it from 
parents, caregivers, and other adults in your family. So after this came ELF bars. So the big difference between this and this is this, this device is over 20 of this device. <laughs> So this device contains up to 25 packs worth of nicotine in this device. It also has a way better battery, so it lasts longer. And as soon as it runs out of charge, all you have to do is plug it into your USB port in your car, or computer, or anything. And for you know, we hope you know, a weeks or more, you have readily available nicotine. Um, the FDA has, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, has started to come down on these, but companies are just making lookalikes. So right now the FDA has officially banned 23 makers, but there are thousands in review, and there are only a few that have been deemed okay, and those are all regular tobacco flavored and not um, flavored, flavored tobacco. So again, one pack of cigarettes is equivalent to one jewel pod, is equivalent to one puff bar. So that's about a five to ten dollar investment. It's a pack of cigarettes worth of nicotine. The newer devices, like the Elf Bar and the Copycats, have five thousand puffs, which is twenty five packs of cigarettes worth of nicotine in just one device. So it's pretty alarming. Um, most of the popular products on the market now have that 5,000 5, hits. Um, and they range from devices that look like this to devices that look like this. Um, Hide is another one that's really, really popular. And as the market grows, they get better at um, developing flavor palettes. So in the old days, you would have like a banana product. Well, now you have a banana cool ice mint. So they're taking the sweet flavor, the mint cool flavor, throwing a little bit of menthol in there, and you have this kind of sophisticated flavor pro profile that's made to taste really good. Um, and the nicotine level in these devices has just gone up and up. And then we get into the oral nicotine products, like the gums and chews. Uh, we hear that teens are using these to ease their cravings. We know they're all over social media. You can actually get toothpicks now that contain nicotine in them. All sorts of products. Now um, for the health effects. So, you know, addiction is really the most worrisome thing um, with vaping. I mean, we, we all know and have had some in our, in our lives that it's been addicted to nicotine. It's a really, really tough addiction to break. We also know that teens' brains are really primed for addiction. Um, areas of the brain that, you know, experience pleasure and, and want, are into risk-taking are growing and fueling so fast. And the areas of the brain that really have that critical thinking and stop, think about this, uh, areas aren't aren't at the same level, so it's kind of the perfect storm. And the industry knows this, and you know they have their market. Addiction is a, a pediatric medical disorder um, by definition, and starts in that connected to the brain chemistry with a more. We also really worry about behavior risks. Um, there are studies that show that e-cigarette use is linked to alcohol and other substance use as well, um, including marijuana. And it's also really scary to think about all the harmful and toxic things that are in the vapes that kids probably aren't thinking about when they're using these products. So we know benzene is found in car exhaust. It's a cancer-causing chemical. Um, diacetyl, which causes popcorn lung, that was in the media a couple years ago. That's a really nasty thing. Uh, a couple other ones.
Oh yeah, heavy metals, like you know, nickel, lead, all that stuff, you really don't want in your body. Another really scary thing to consider is that these things have strong batteries in them and they're not always stable. There's also no good guidance about how to dispose of these vapes. We have heard of them exploding. Usually that happens when they're being charged or starting fires. Um, the DNR considers nicotine a toxic chemical and then you throw a lithium battery in there and we haven't had any real good um, answers when we talk about how we're supposed to get rid of these things. So we're hearing from a lot of people in the community, teachers, school nurses, SROs that you know, thought they would just throw them in a drawer. Well, now those doors are full. And they're like, what are we going to do with these things? We also worry about uh, people who sell these products. You know, what, what do they do with excess stock? Just throw it out in the dumpster? Uh, yeah. It's not great. So as I said before, you know, different parts of the brain mature at different levels or at different times. And this really creates an imbalance in the systems. The brain does still mature up to the age of 25, and you know we're no, we know that kids are experimenting a lot younger than that. And the reward center drive is very strong. And the decision-making strategies are still developing. So here's a long, scary list of things that we really worry about with teen vaping: uh, increased susceptibility to addiction changes in memory and learning, reduced attention span, enhanced mood alterations and mood disorders, permanent decreased impulse control, increased risk of developing psychiatric disorders, diminished co cognitive functioning, worsened anxiety symptoms and depression, and increased stress. I love this slide. I, I think it just really hits home. You know, the adolescent brain brain is really primed for addiction, and tobacco companies know this. This is a poster that a uh, youth tobacco prevention group that I was a part of with East High School students actually developed for their peers. And as you can see on the one side, it's all the things that are in the are in the vapes other than nicotine. And then the other side showing, you know, what you risk. I thought this was really well done, and the kids kind of came up with a really great way of, of showing it. So that's a lot, and we'll just keep going. Um, unfortunately, teens who use these cigarettes are three times more likely to use cannabis products. So we know there's a big intersection or an overlap when we talk about teen vaping and cannabis use. So we have a couple slides to just dig a little bit deeper into that. We know like from the prevention or the principles of prevention that the longer somebody waits to try these things, the less likely they are to get addicted uh, and have adverse health income outcomes. And we know that vaping cannabis is common among young people, and certain parts of the plant um, can be extracted to create really adverse effects. So this is from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. This is from, I believe it was last year. It shows one in three teens have tried cannabis by 12th grade, so by the time that they graduate high school. More than 6% of high school seniors use cannabis daily. And here's some impacts on youth. So we know that young, sorry, lung illness is associated with vaping and smoking. It can be hard on the lungs. It can have lasting impact. Uh, effects on the brain as well since the brain is still forming. There's an increased accidental poisoning risk because of the different levels and variations that we're finding in cannabis products. And there's a real problem with the fact that more black and brown people are being arrested for the use of cannabis products. So cannabis 
derivatives. Um, cannabis is kind of a blanket term for the whole plant. So it's both the hemp plant and the marijuana plant, but those things, those two um, plants are very different. Inside the cannabis plants, there's something called cannabinoids, and that is what gets you high. THC is another compound, and it's found in way higher levels in the marijuana plant. And CBD is the compound that is more associated with the hemp plant. So hemp and marijuana are related, but they have different levels of THC and CBD. Marijuana has way more THC, and hemp has way more CBD. So marijuana, we know, is psychoactive and gets you high. It has more than 3% of THC, and hemp is not in its natural form intoxicating, and it has less than 3% CBD. But in 2018, when they amended the Farm Bill, they made hemp a legal product, and they did this so that people could use it for hemp fibers, clothing, plastics, and other materials. But what they didn't expect, I don't think, was that the hemp itself could be taken into the lab in very, very small trace amounts of cannabinoids like Delta-8, Delta-9, and THCA could be extracted out. And then the levels could be jacked up. So now you have something that came from a plant that is not psychoactive, but it's been chemically altered to be something that can get you really hot. So again, CBD is the non-psychoactive compound. A lot of people have heard of like CBD lotions or CBD massage, and you know, are taking it as a supplement for stress uh, or pain. But the hemp derivatives that are now found in products um, are intoxicating. So, if it comes from a hemp plant and not a marijuana plant, it is technically legal in Wisconsin. Um, these are different parts of the hemp plant and different derivatives that are found. Uh, there are products widely available in your community and all throughout the state that contain these derivatives. Um, this is a pack of gummies that have 10 milligram Delta-8 gummies. I've heard that one of these is an entry level dose, which would seem to uh, produce a mild euphoric sensation. This product was purchased right next to it. These gummies have a thousand milligrams of uh, Delta-8, Delta-9 in them. So one gummy, a hundred gummies, same size, same thing. And that's where we're seeing kids get into a lot of trouble. So we're seeing Delta-8 and cannabis pro products in gummies, drinks, and vapes. Here's something that looks a lot like an energy drink. It has 100 milligrams of Delta-8 in it, which would be like taking 10 gummies. So if you can imagine a kid you know, getting their hands on this, drinking it, and then they can have really adverse effects. Here are some other products that we see in stores. I know. Uh, there's a, a bakery in Madison where I live that sells lattes and, and lemonades and uh, baked goods that all contain cannabis. And these products aren't technically age restricted because that, or Wisconsin has not uh, passed any sort of laws around these products. They fall under the federal farm bill uh, loophole. So there isn't really any age restriction and it's just up to the person selling the products whether they want to do so or not. We know from our partners in the Fox Valley that they actually have vending machines in their community that anybody can go and purchase these products without any sort of age restriction at all. We're also seeing things that look a lot like the marijuana plant that are actually a part of the hemp plant, which is then sprayed with all these Delta-8, Delta-9, THCA chemicals to make to turn it into something that wasn't intoxicating into something that is intoxicating. These products can look very similar to each other as I showed with the gummies, so it's really easy to misdose or overdose.
And here are some side effects that, that we're seeing. And what's good to note here is I think a lot of people think that these products aren't uh, a big deal and you know they can take a little bit and feel good but because of the wide variation in strength in these products we are seeing a lot of people take more than they had initially thought in 2023 in madison we had 300 ems or emergency services called due to the fact that somebody took too much cannabis um, and we're having what they thought was a medical emergency um, we hear our EMS people say that they're having heart palpitations, anxiety, hallucinations, panic attacks, nausea, dizziness, sleepiness, erratic, erratic behavior, etc. Um, I think people assume these products aren't as strong as they are or they accidentally take too much. Um, when you smoke a product, you feel the effects within 10 to 15 minutes. But when you eat a gummy, it takes an hour to an hour and a half to feel anything. So I think what's happening is people just take more and more, looking for the effect that they want, and end up taking way too much. We recently had an EMS call, I think it was yesterday, a 17-year-old. She said her face was numb, she couldn't feel her face, and she thought she was dying. That's usually not the, the reason that people seek out cannabis products. So if we just talk about safer storage. So if you have these products around, make sure that they have child resistant packaging, they're out of sight, consider safety locks, and be mindful and pro proactive about storing food products away from intoxicating products. We get this question asked all the time, is marijuana laced with fentanyl? We don't have any confirmed uh, cases of this happening. Uh, we know that in the field that when things are tested, sometimes it will test positive for, for um, fentanyl, but the colors for fentanyl and for THC are very similar. So we can't call that conclusive. The DEA has never uh, specifically had an alert put out about fentanyl being in marijuana flower, like they have for Xanax and Percocet and Vicodin, and obviously like meth and heroin. Um, and I believe the state crime lab, we checked with them and they have not seen fentanyl in a marijuana plant flower that they've tested. So I'm not saying that this can't happen, I'm just saying that we're not really seeing it, but what we are seeing is a frighteningly high amount of EMS calls due to the fact that people are just over consuming these products. So now we'll get into some education and policy. So 88% of smokers start before they're 18. Um, I would think that that would be in line with vapors as well. 95% start before they're 21. So we know that keeping that initial first use from kids um, ingesting you know, for the first time, keeping that low really helps people live a tobacco-free lifestyle. Um, the federal government passed a law saying that you had to be 21 to purchase any tobacco product in 2019. Trump actually signed that law, um, but Wisconsin is one of only eight states that hasn't passed our own law, which puts, a, puts us really out of step with the rest of the country. So because our law still says 18, we can only use 16 and 17 year old youth inspectors when we go out in our community to do our checks. And we're still seeing about a 15% sales, sales rate. That means that those businesses are selling to someone who is technically five years too young to be buying the products. We've tried to pass a Tobacco 21 law twice, but just with gridlock and, and politics, it just hasn't gone through. So yeah, we're, we're one of only eight states that hasn't passed it. 
There was a vape shop license bill that was just passed. So up until that point, a vape shop could open without any license at all from the state if they didn't sell other tobacco products. Now if they sell anything containing nicotine, they do have to be licensed from the state. But it isn't a very hard process, and it, there isn't a lot that goes into it. Um, unfortunately, when that bill passed, it stopped local um, municipalities from doing much at point of sale. So, for instance, uh, a small community couldn't pass a law stronger than the state law, and that's something called preemption. So even if they wanted to, a small community couldn't pass a law saying no vape shops or um, you can't use coupons or anything like that. One thing that still can be done is zoning because that falls in a different part of the legal code. So that is something that we're working with communities to, to learn more about. So these stores aren't popping up right next to each other and a community doesn't have, isn't overrun with vape shops. Wisconsin WINS is our statewide compliance check program. So that's when we go out into the communities with the 16 and 17 year olds and try to purchase tobacco from local retailers. I think I said we were here in November and then we were here again a couple weeks ago. We love coming to Stoughton. The kids always have their favorite places to eat. Um, yeah, last year we did uh, over 400 checks throughout the county. And again, we're having that 13 to 15% sales rate. Fact is our youth tobacco prevention movement. Um, we are we have a fact group at East High School right now, but they're mostly seniors and graduating. This is something that can be implemented in schools as kind of a peer-to-peer -to -peer tobacco prevention strategy, kind of youth-led and youth-designed. Uh, I think Stoughton had one at one point. A couple um, years, not years the time ago. I've been here, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> We always like to mention tobacco-free be beaches and parks. There's a couple communities in Dane County that actually have these ordinances, and it goes a far, a long way with positive social norming. So we know like 15 years ago, you know, you'd walk into a bowling alley or a tavern or even a restaurant and there'd be people smoking cigarettes. Now you would, that would be unheard of, you know? So uh, we think that tobacco-free beaches and parks could be the, the next iteration of that. So instead of going to a park or a playground and having somebody smoking a cigarette or even vaping next to you in your family, we could change that so the new positive social norm would be tobacco-free outdoor places for everyone to recreate. And we also see a lot, a lot of litter in our public places like beaches and parks. Um, cigarettes are still the number one littered item, and I unfortunately see vapes discarded all the time. Um, including e-cigarettes and our, our municipal smoke-free air policies. So at Stoughton has actually done this, which is awesome. And it means that you don't have to worry about somebody vaping next to you at your job or at a restaurant or in a, another public building. Um, this isn't everywhere. It's community by community right now, and we'd love to see a statewide um, amendment that includes e-cigarettes because they do produ produce that aerosol and it isn't just harmless water vapor all that stuff like diacetyl and that heavy metals that are inhaled when you vape also get exhaled into the air this is kind of a slide that shows the fda crackdowns so unfortunately, the FDA is really playing catch up here. We know that the Juul epidemic really exploded, you know, in 2016, 17, 18, when vaping rates were 35% among our young people. Uh, they finally banned flavored Juul pods in 2020. They notified companies that they could no longer sell these products. And then in 2022, they said, hey, we can regulate any kind of nicotine, doesn't matter if it's synthetic or not. We know that the puff bar kind of fad was a few years before that, so again, a whole 
another chunk of kids are addicted to, to nicotine products by this point. And then in 2023, the FDA put retailers on notice. So they singled out some vapes that they said were clearly targeting kids, and these are up, um, up there for you guys to take. Like Elf Bar, Puff Bar, which you guys have seen in some other copycats, and said that these are illegal to sell. Um, we have seen some stores take these off the shelves. We have, we also see these widely still available. And like I showed before, as soon as one gets banned, you know something very very similar takes its place. And then it's up to the FDA to kind of play catch up. Um, they did, the FDA did find some retailers, 22 nationwide. One of them was in Milwaukee, so it's a really small number, but the fine was substantial, $19,000. So what we're hoping is there's more of these, unfortunately, you know, people have to pay money, but that it sends a clear message and that some of these flavored products that are targeting kids will be taken off the market. We talked about this before, just about uh, the loopholes and lookalikes. So this is kind of the, the game that um, the vape manufacturers uh, have been playing, you know, for the last 10 years. We always throw, like to talk about the menthol ban. Um, flavored cigarettes were banned all the way back in 2009, but menthol was excluded from that. Um, there's been talk about banning menthol because menthol is used among um, black and brown people at very high rates. Um, over 90% of African American smokers smoke menthol cigarettes, and it does due to industry targeting, um, dating all the way back to the 50s and 60s. President Biden had said that he would sign a menthol ban. Um, the FDA put one on his desk but he has yet to sign it. Um, the word around that is that it's you know, an election cycle and that it might um, put some people off. These slides are all how to talk to your kids. And if anybody's interested, this um, guide comes from the American Lung Association and it's a really great resource to have. Um, you can scan the QR code if you like. So I always like to start by knowing the facts. You guys are all here. I feel like that is number one. Um, trying to put yourself in your kid's shoes. I mean, I can't even imagine being a high school student in this world, in this day and age that we live in. Um, there's so many pressures and peer, you know, peer and otherwise. Um, it's really good to always center your kid in their experience. Take an open and calm approach. This is something I always have to remind myself of because it is really scary. Um, you don't want your kids, you know, addicted to or using these products. Find the right time and place. I feel like I've gotten better about this as a mom organically. Like if I see somebody vaping or if we pass a vape store or watch a Netflix and see it, I'll take that time to kind of mention something like, you know, is anything changed? You know, are your, are your friends vaping? You know, have, do you have any questions? And then take time to practice. While you're talking, it's always good to acknowledge your kids' independence. Um, you know, our kids make great decisions for the most part every day, and being tobacco free can just be another one of those decisions. Ask for their perspective. Try not to be the one talking all the time. Be ready to hear that your child may have vaped. This one is scary, um, but we know that kids experiment and we know that sometimes experimenting is just that. Blame big tobacco, not your kid. Um, these products are made specifically for youth buyers um, to addict them for a lifetime. Avoid scare tactics. And connect with what they care about. So this is something that's that I've again been working on with my kids because every kid is different. So I have a, a real academic kind of high achieving kid. So I talk about you know the brain and circuits and synapses and stuff with her. And then I have another kid who's more sports minded. So we talk about you know the lasting effects on the lungs. 
and the heart and things like that. Say thank you after you talk. Help your child manage stress. This is a big one. I feel like a lot of kids do turn to vapes for stress relief, and we know that it actually is just the opposite. It kind of puts them in this perpetual cycle of addiction. Um, but they are looking, kids are looking at ways to manage their stress and however we can support them, um, we should. Again, with peer pressure. And always follow up. I don't think any substance use discussion with kids should ever be a one and done. It's not always the easiest thing to talk to with your kids, but it should be kind of on that regular rotation. Stay up to date. Things are always changing, as we've talked about. And share information. Cute little slider the communication the lady put together for me. And again, if you missed it or would like um, more in-depth ways to talk to your kids, you can always scan this QR code. The Wisconsin Quit Line retooled uh, their approach to young people. They developed a text quit line that anybody 13 through 25, I think that's the, the age that they're really gearing towards, can text instead of calling because we know a lot of kids don't like to talk on the phone. Um, so this is kind of their new retooled way for resources. A lot of times kids that have more significant nicotine addictions do need medical intervention and sometimes medication. And again, uh, this is my slide, my last slide. My name, Miranda Phelps McGuire, and a QR code if you would like to fill out a quick uh, survey about the present. And now we can have a discussion and talk about any questions that you might have or any comments that you have for me. Yeah, I mean that would be so awesome, and it it sounds simple, right? But it's it. There's thousands of these products that are in this queue at the FDA waiting for quote unquote approval. When we know the only vapes that have ever been approved are just tobacco flavored. So it would make a lot of sense, but I'm not sure how the federal government works. And um, yeah, technically, there aren't any flavored devices that the FDA has said it's, it's an FDA, it, it's fine. Um, so all the products that are flavored are somewhere in that limbo, which also means that there is no regulation, so we don't really know what's in them. We don't have an ingredient list. There's nothing on the back that tells you what's in it. And that's also the same for all the Delta products that we're seeing that are legally purchased. So if you go down to South Beloit to like the marijuana dispensary and get legally purchased marijuana, they'll show you. Like, it's this strength, and it's this product, and kind of talk you through it. But there's no way, there's no regulation with this kind of stuff at all. So, it's another problem. It's legal until it's not. It's really legal. Yeah. some Yeah. We're seeing states that have legal marijuana. They're actually making the, this kind of stuff illegal. So it's kind of the flip here in Wisconsin, where we don't have legal marijuana, but there's all this stuff that, you know, produces really strong highs that isn't regulated at all. Does anybody else have a, any questions? Are, are kind of constantly inundated by uh, 
uh, what's new and what's coming and where did they come from? And the kids know more about it than we do. Um, I actually had an intern this summer that we went shopping um, <laughs> and updated my supply of things to show parents and she explained what she knew from you know POD campus uh, for me. And, oh, this is a new flavor. I hadn't heard of this one before. And I was like, okay. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it has really changed. And even, you know, like in the two years since I've been uh, working with this stuff, I mean, these were like, these were the thing that kids were using two years ago. And now, you know, you have something that has, you know, 20 times worth of more nicotine in it with a stronger battery that can be recharged. So it just, it, it really is evolving and changing um, so fast. And the Delta products, we're just starting to kind of learn more about. Uh, there are so many stores out there. There are so many different kinds of products. I went shopping too. And I think the clerk thought I was a little kooky because I was buying like the, the, the least amount of strength and the highest amount. She was probably like, what is this lady looking for? But it is just crazy to think that one of these gummies is equivalent to a hundred of these and what 16 year old you know is really going to take the time to like read and you know comprehend that uh, it is kind of like the wild west and there are a lot of products like Teresa said that are just like constantly emerging and popping up well and the vaping part with THC is a lot of it is being vaped too um, and so that or it's mixed in with the other things that are being and um, and our police actually aren't really testing vape devices anymore because they're too dangerous to take apart and handle. Um, uh, but uh, in the past, I think countywide, there was a pretty high ratio of THC and all of them were being tested. So you could kind of make a presumption um, for that. And again, it's easy access. It's not like the old joint coughing. There's no coughing involved. In any of this use really. Um, so uh, much, much easier to not show signs of. Um, I think the other part that we need to keep kind of abreast of with all of this is the intensity of those chemicals. The intensity of the nicotine, the intensity of the THC is just completely absurd now. I mean, good old days, you know, um, original marijuana was like 10% and now this is manufactured to a point where it's barely even classified as a plant anymore. And a lot of it is 90% or even higher in some cases, depending on, which is why they go through with you how much is, you know, and the safety for yourself. Um, yeah, when you buy it at a shop. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We have a, a, a slide in our cannabis uh, slide deck that the heading is not your mom's weed. And it kind of, I mean, it's just like that. You know, it's, it's so different than what was on the market even 20 years ago. Um, so much more strong. So, yeah. Is there, um, I, I, I don't see it going on Netflix, lens of like the business behind Jewel and how they were able to kind of explode this market that really didn't exist before because even though e-cigarettes had been on the market for 10 years the amount of people that were using them was very small and certainly that you know flavors and kids and all that like Jewel just like blew it up so I think it would be I think it would be good I've heard good things about take a look at any of the stuff I have on the table or ask me a question, I'll hang out for a little bit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.